Hello, everyone, and welcome to Tisch College's final Civic Life launch event of the spring semester. Entitled Science plus Music plus Action, What if we change how we look at and hear the climate crisis? My name is Henry Liu. I am a PhD student in economics and public policy, and also a pre-doctoral research fellow at the Climate Policy Lab at Tufts University. I'm thrilled to be kicking off today's event. I want to thank today's co-sponsors, including the Environmental Studies Program, the Fletcher School, the Music Department, and the Office of Sustainability at Tufts for their support and partnership. As a student at Tufts University and the Fletcher School, it's always a pleasure to connect with my fellow Jumbos across the globe who are doing meaningful work. Today's event highlights an organization founded and run by Tufts alums, Laurie Goldman, class of 1983, and Stephen Crawford, Fletcher class of 1989, as well as Fran Schubert. We want to thank Laurie, Stephen, and Fran for their collaboration today and for the impactful work they do through the Climate Music Project. By combining the talents and expertise of world-class scientists, composers, musicians, artists, and technology visionaries, the Climate Music Project enables the creation and staging of science-guided science music and visual experiences that inspire people to engage actively on the issue of climate change. The Climate Music Project harnesses the accessibility of music to tell the urgent story of climate change to diverse audiences in a way that resonates, educates, and motivates. They also provide resources and contacts to channel the emotive energy of their audiences into action, which you will experience later in the program. It's my pleasure today to introduce our guests from the Climate Music Project, as well as our moderator. Dr. Bill Colley is the lead science advisor for What If Way, an original climate music composition we will listen to and experience together shortly. Dr. Colley is the director for the Climate and Ecological Science Division at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And he teaches in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science and directs the new multi-campus Climate Readiness Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. He was a lead author on the fourth assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, for which the IPCC was awarded the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. Wendy Nomis is a San Francisco-based composer who has won the ASCAP Plus Award for composition four times and released 16 CDs of her composition for Coopers, including an acoustic ensemble, Phoenix Rising piano vocal duo, as well as solo piano works. She has performed with various ensembles nationally and internationally. Wendy is the lead composer for What Is Way. A poet, Royal Kent, has performed with dancers, theatric troops, poets, and many bands, including, including the Vancouver-based Band of Andrews and Zik Republic-based Pseudo Pseudo. He has produced TV, radio, and stage shows and is a co-founder of independent label Coopers, Multimedia. As a poet MC, he has opened major reggae concerts for Peter Tosh, Toots, The Matos, Steel Paws, and The Waiters. An original poem by Royal is included in What If Way. Joining our guests in conversation is lecturer with Tufts University's Environmental Studies Program, Dr. Lee Brown. Dr. Brown's work and research focuses on ecology, conservation biology, animal migration and movement ecology, climate and land cover change, environmental and health data science, and art science projects and collaborations. Now I invite Wendy up on screen to briefly say a few words about what if we. Welcome, Wendy. Hello. Thank you so much for including us in this wonderful event. I'm here to introduce the piece, What If We, that was written in collaboration with Climate Music Project, whom you've heard a little bit about. 
And the piece includes the Copus Ensemble, which is a quartet consisting of myself as composer, Royal Kent as poet, Patrick Mahan on bass, and Levon Washington on drums. Uh, it also includes the sonifications by Molly Monahan and the visuals by Angelo Ciaccio. So the idea of what if we is based on sea level rise data that get intermixed with the musical composition. So when we sat down with Climate Music Project, I really wanted to have the piece start with the worst case scenario, meaning that we don't make any changes and we just continue on our climate crisis course that we're on now. So at the beginning, you'll hear the the sound of the timpani, the sound of a synthesizer, um, and the sonifications representing sea level rise up to the year 2100. Uh, it gradually gets more intense. The sonifications get more jagged, more angular. Um, in the middle of the first section, you will hear sound bites, and they are representing uh, projected newscasts and uh, social media from the year 2045, if we do nothing. And then near the end of the first section, you will hear an increase uh, of the drums. And so we, we decided to make the bass represent landmass and the drums represent the sea level rising. So eventually you will hear the drums overtake the bass. The beginning of the second section uh, includes the singing of, of young children. Um, it's an innocence and it's also a representation of, of hope. So the second section is about um, mitigation. If we make changes, um, how our future would be different. So the music switches from being in the minor key to being in a major key. It also switches from a synthesizer bass to piano. The music becomes more uh, ambient and becomes, uh, there's a little bit of a gospel feel to the music in this section. So you'll hear that, that shift um, that is a result of, of mitigation. And you also hear a poem by Royal Kent that is a, a tribute to the natural life, the beauty and the power of, of the natural life. So without further ado, I present to you, What If We? Thank you. I think this is where you have to start playing live. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
We have no sound. September 15, 2045. Rising sea levels could cost the world $14 trillion a year by 2100. September 15, 2045. The Arctic Ocean is ice free for the first time. September 15, 2045. Residents of the Maldives are struggling with increasing flooding due to sea level rise. September 15, 2045. In the UK, the Houses of Parliament and Westminster Abbey are both flooded. September 15, 2045. Sea level rise could flood 1.9 million U.S. homes by the year 2100.
eagle leaves fire in her wake. Tiger's life is at stake. Eagle descends with a crushing blow. Tiger defends, as you know, in a mighty leap. Eagle is not slow. Tiger doesn't sleep. And over there in the distance are the mountain peaks whose fingertips touch the water's feet, whose breath is our sky. So that in challenging times, our true colors appear just as sure as the dust, the sand, and the rain. And with this approaching storm, known by its name, as the clouds, the sun, the waves, and the wind take aim. Because now that the science and the tally has been taken, what has been revealed to us all, we call climate change. Whose face is written in the sky whose ram dwells atop the mountain peak, whose fish reside below blue deep, whose bull strong and sleek, whose twins one's awake, one's asleep. So that was really amazing. <laughs> um, just wanted to say um, welcome again and thank you so much for being with us and sharing this great work. Um, what if we, um, I think before we dive into some of like more specific questions about the piece itself, I was, I was wondering, I'm curious how each of you got involved with the climate music um, project. Um, were, you know, what drew you to the organization's work and were you specifically recruited or did you reach out to them? Um, the way that I made the connection or that Copus the band made the connection was there was an ad, I believe it was on Facebook, but it was in so, some social media saying, would you like to play for the planet? And I said, yes, I, I'd like to play for the planet. So it, there was the, the global summit that was happening in San Francisco and I believe it was 2018. I'm not 100% sure that the date now with the pandemic, I don't know dates anymore, but I think that was the year. And so, um, and so then we uh, played for that performance um, outside uh, uh, live and it was just a wonderful experience and met everybody from Climate Music. And then, and then they asked us if we would like to um, work on a piece with them. And so Royal and I started meeting with with them. 
Thank you. And, and um, Dr. Collins, how did you become involved? Uh, very fortunately, I had an, um, a younger colleague who was approached about doing sort of um, a composition in a day in uh, one of the exe executive teams, Stephen Crawford's studios in downtown San Francisco. So Andy and I went there and um, met um, Eli Walker and his group, and we just composed a piece in a day and we performed it that evening. And mm -hmm. I was hooked because I, I had been looking for new ways of communicating climate science to general audiences. And um, you know, I, and I'm asked all the time, can you communicate the science better? And I thought, well, let's go for hearts and minds. So this was my attempt to kind of break out of my usual little scientist jail cell and mm -hmm. communicate the science more effectively. Great, thank you so much. I think it's, it's nice for the audience, I think, to hear about ways that people get involved with work like this, particularly if they're interested, for instance, in, in being involved in this type of work. Um, why, how or why did you decide to focus specifically on, on sea level rise? Did you want to take that or Royal? Um, I, that I don't know the answer to, to tell you the answer. Okay. <laughs> it was decided, um, I think someone else decided that. And so uh, maybe Bill, you can take it because sure. that became what it was focused on. And um, mm -hmm. so I'm not really sure the answer to that question. So the, the, um, what, the way that the composition process works is that the science advisors work with the composers and we try to pick a particular aspect of climate science that we think could be rendered as a meaningful and expressive piece of music. Um, we had not touched on sea level rise and, until we started working with, with Wendy and Royal. Um, and, and the reason why sea level rise is so important is that uh, it's, it touches so many of our lives. There are 600 million people worldwide who, who live within about 30 feet of the ocean surface. So as the ocean rises, it touches a lot of people. And it also is a focus of much of our food, much of our commerce. So we thought this is something that people can really relate to and connect with. And, uh, and it's also a place where uh, as the ocean rises, there's a, as Wendy's piece alludes to, there's a really strong climate justice component. Many of the people, many of the island nations that are being affected were not the beneficiaries from burning all the fossil fuels, uh, but they're the people like in the Maldives, Maldives are just one meter above sea level that are being touched the first. So this also brought a very strong climate justice and environmental justice component to the piece, which you thought would, would connect well with, again, with broader audiences. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, I, something that I really noticed um, in watching this is I really like the balance between the more intense portion of the music and the images associated with the business as usual approach um, versus the much softer approach to the portion associated with actually taking action now. And I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit more about the technical and creative choices um, that you made through composition um, and, vis and visuals with and how they work together to create this unique experience? Um, for me, musically, um, the most difference between part one and part two is that it shifts from a minor key to a major key, which in music is like the biggest kind of division that you can find. Um, and also to shift from a synthesizer to a piano to move to something that's more acoustic. Um, those were two big, that two big factors that, that made changes there. And also the, the sonifications that were created basically were the, the data of sea level rise at, in different scenarios, either mitigated or not. Um, they were created to me fascinating um, from the chord structure of the piece so that the sounds were uh, created from the data, but then related to the, to the actual chord structure of the piece. So that was really fascinating um, and a bit of a challenge to, because when you have sounds that are created uh, digitally, electronically, and you have a live band working with it, even if you're amazing rhythmically, 
you still are not to the increment of what a, an electronic can do. So for us to line up, that was actually sort of an interesting challenge. Um, it was easier in the second part because it was a little more, it was a little bit looser and the sound was a little gentler, but the first part was quite a challenge to get everything to line up. Thank you. Sure. Um, and I, I'm also curious with that second part. So then you overload, you had mentioned in your introduction, the images of the children and also the, the poetry. Um, could you share something a little bit about um, the, the poetic piece and, and the inspiration for that and, and how that was incorporated? Well, the poetry, the, the, the poetry uh, represents the, the rest of the creatures on the earth besides us humans. Uh, so we wanted to give them voice, you know. And uh, as far as the inspiration, uh, Wendy and I have been working together for many years. And uh, she writes around my lyrics and I write lyrics around her compositions. So it works both ways. In this particular instance, it was very easy to uh, construct a, a science-oriented poem that that, <laughs> that still represented the practical world. You see, the creatures of the earth, and so we tried to try to uh, showcase them a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's it's very beautiful and moving. Um, Thank you. So it's actually interesting to hear, so you two have worked together for a while and I think probably know a little bit about how each other works and um, and how to communicate with each other. Um, how can you tell, share a little bit about some of the challenges of working, for instance, with scientists and incorporating some of the science to create a shared vision? So my understanding with art, you know, collaborations between art and science, there's definitely there, you have to have a, a lot of respect for each other's expertise, mm -hmm. um, and there's push and pull. So I'm curious what compromises you you know had to be made on both sides to both maintain the integrity of the science, but then also allow for the expression of the the music and the poetry and the images. Mm -hmm. I think a um, couple things. One, um, what I talked about the sonifications that was a technical challenge. Um, there's a a woman, Alison Marklein, who is um, in the Cl Climate Music Project group, and she is a scientist, but also a musician. And that she was kind of a great liaison. And we sat down together a lot and I had the, the score, the music, and we went over things together. And um, that was really helpful to have somebody who speaks both languages, basically. Um, uh, and I think one of the interesting challenges was the the idea of the drums overtaking the bass sound. So when you have, when we decided collectively to have the drums represent the ocean and, and to have the bass represent land mass, and so one is overtaking the other. Um, it's in musician talk to the band, it was sort of difficult to say, okay, well, it can't just get louder. It has to get now 22% louder and now 67% loud. Like, so, to translate that to musicians, it, it was kind of had some humorous aspects to it because the drummer was like, I don't know how to be 67% louder. So, <laughs> so it became a, a really a fun and interesting thing to, to have that happen, to go along with how the data, what was happening um, with the data. So that that was a challenge, but um, but was, was fun besides. <laughs> Let me uh, also point out that uh, Dr. Collins, Bill, as we call him, um, came to several of our rehearsals. And I, I distinctly recall him uh, as I was constructing the poem. I had, you know, it was nowhere near the completed version. He asked to see the lyrics, and I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it, it made me feel actually pretty good that he would take an interest in the lyrics. I'd have to say that the, the, um, going to 
the studio was one of the highlights, right, of this whole process for me because, yeah. you know, it was, it was fun uh, just sort of listening to the musicians pull the piece together and, um, and also uh, talking with them a little bit about the import of the data. So that, that way, you know, because it's one, really, you know, data is one thing, but actually understanding what it means for people, what it means for ecosystems. That was something that Alice and I could communicate and which I think provided a little bit of a, an emotional foundation to the piece mm -hmm. um, yeah. to help, help inspire Wendy and, and Royal and, the, and their fellow musicians mm -hmm. come up with something that was um, really contrasted business as usual with the world where we try to mitigate climate change as actively as, as the IPCC and, and all of us are advising. Yeah. Can you share anything sort of the, like some of the most memorable things you, you learned from each other in working with this or something you would say that you learned that you might, advice you might give to others trying to create something where you really are blending the art and the science to reach um, audiences, greater audiences? Mm. Uh, let's see. I think the, I think patience. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I tend to be, like to get things done, not that it wasn't happening, but sometimes the pace of things, um, Royal will tell you, I, I'm like a, sometimes a kind of a runaway horse getting things done. As an independent artist, you have to hustle everything yourself and promote and wear many hats. That's why I always wear a hat because you're, you're always doing some kind of promotion. And so to take the time to get things exactly right um, was something that I think is a, a, a good challenge uh, to know as other people become involved that the process is is incremental and it's it's slow but then it will it will produce some amazing results if you're if you're patient with it i, I think the, the composition process here is not fast mm -hmm. um, because we're, we're engaged in such an act of translation from you know i mean the the data looks nothing like a musical score. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it's pretty, you know, it's hard to compose to mm -hmm. um, because things don't change for a long time and then suddenly they change very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so what we have found with composers is that for them to kind of get their, their minds wrapped around the whole proposition of time and how it's laid out in the composition, mm -hmm. that's actually, it, that process is really front loaded mm -hmm. and it takes quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, to figure out how to grapple with time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I learned that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> great. That's great. So actually speaking of that, so I work a lot, um, I focus, a lot of my work focuses on environmental data science and data visualization. And so this, I was actually really fascinated by the data piece of this using data sonification, which from my understanding is sort of the auditory equivalent of data visualization in some ways. I don't want to simplify it more than um, it should be. Um, and I think you shared a little bit about this process and, and how it was used um, very eloquently, actually. Um, how did you decide which specific parts of the data to include? Was it like, OK, these parts are just too challenging, or um, you know, in these parts, let's just go with these? Or was there something more methodical about how you chose which parts to include? Um, Bill, do you know the answer to that? I, I um, we worked with Molly. Molly Monahan was was in charge of of the of having the sonifications, and so we did a lot of test. We did a lot of testing, and um, to break down the first section, for example, uh, the 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 basic repeating chord structure, even though it's it's changing, but it's there is a set, there's a pattern to it. So. Um, to me, what was really interesting to hear just the sonifications by themselves was how the, the sound got crunchier, if you can learn a very non-technical term, but the, the sound started to break up more and become more like jarring and pixelated. And um, how exactly that worked, I beyond me, I don't know. That I don't know. But I, I do know that as we worked with it, it made more sense. The longer we did it, the made more sense to the structure of the piece. Um, maybe you so can yeah, add I think, 
Yeah. Yeah. What would happen is <laughs> Allison would sit down with Wendy and Royal and the musicians, and then she would come back to me and we would have this, you know, geek out session about what data would to sort of feed to Wendy next. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, Allison was acting as the interface between the scientific world and the mus musical world. And then she and I would come back, she would come back to me and we would confer and then sort of iterate with Wendy. And, uh, but I think the other thing that you're hearing is that this is the exact opposite of taking the data and just shoving it, shoveling it into a synthesizer. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is not, you know, this is, this is a very human curated process to create a compelling artwork. Because um, otherwise we could be cranking these things out, you know, several times a day, but yeah. it, to actually create a piece that works musically mm -hmm. and that reaches audiences and touches audiences, that, that's what takes the time. Mm -hmm. What's interesting that the creation of it to me in itself is a science. So there was a science to creating that art, <laughs> yeah. um, and it, it was really cool. And actually, um, even to add on to that, that the visuals actually came after. So if you think of very often in the in the film world, in the traditional Hollywood film world, that most of the time the the story and the scene and all the filming visually happens first, and then the music is added on tacked on <laughs> so to have the sound to have all the audio be first and then the visual um was also interesting to do that in in, in, the, in the opposite way um dr collins from your perspective as a climate scientist you sort of touched on this earlier um but as someone i'm guessing who is more used to seeing data in a more visual format um what is your Just impression of yeah, what is your impression <laughs> of the work and how well do you really feel like the data are represented and communicated um, and maybe appropriate for the audience? Well, I, I'd say they're communicated much more in a much more impactful way, right? I, I stare at graphs all day, every day, and I show audiences. Unfortunately, I'm in the bad habit of showing audiences graphs of data. Um, and the, the, my general impression from, from that style of pre, uh, pre, presenting information to general audiences is that they leave feeling defeated by the enormity of the problem. And what is so incredibly different and much more effective about rendering the data as music is that the audience can walk away from the presentation feeling like they want to engage in a constructive way. Uh, and that, so I'd say it's, it's much more effective. I mean, they may not know the precise numbers, but that's not so important. What is important is that they, they come away with the sense that through humanitarian action, we can affect positive change and that change will be for the better. So yeah, I'd say it's all, you know, that's much more effective than showing them a line, a, a graph, like you and I look at. Thank you. Um, it's also, you know, something that um, it's easy to not really acknowledge, but I think combining the, the visuals and the music does a much, it's, it's evokes much more, you know, emotion, uh, which I think is part of the purpose of, of art is to actually evoke emotion. And I think it really does a much nicer job. There are a lot of, you know, there's a ton of art science pieces and especially so many of them address climate change. Um, and it seems, you know, just from even talking to students in my class, the things that are most memorable are these pieces that also include the, the sound and really that's what we remember. Mm -hmm. um, that actually, it's kind of, it brings me to a question. So a lot of these art science projects and collaborations are really good at evoking emotion, but they don't necessarily give the audience um, a lot of tools for, actually taking action. Um, and I think this also relates to a question that the Tisch College grapples with deeply and has been asking many of its speakers this year, which is, you know, what is ours to do in this moment? Um, so I'm curious, what do you hope people both feel when they listen and watch What If We, but specifically also what action or impact um, do you hope it leads to? So if everyone who heard this piece were to, you know, go leave this and do one thing or take one action, 
uh, to help combat the global climate crisis, what do, would that be for you, for each of you maybe? I think for me, um, that was part of why when we talked about the structure of the piece, I wanted to end with the, the most positive note available so that it would spur to people rather than just throwing your hands up and saying, oh, well, it's terrible, there's nothing I can do. So as a, as a lay person, I think that for me, and we've talked about this with the band, um, any, anything that you can do, <laughs> pick one thing. You can uh, stop driving on Friday. You can write to your Congress people. You can give up eating meat. You can do, there's a lot of things that you can pick one, do anything, <laughs> like do something um, so that it, it, it becomes a responsibility uh, of each individual to, to make some changes. And of course, with the, with the panel available of, of a climate music project, they can help you uh, with suggestions and things that you can do in your own life um, to, to make your environment better and globally make the environment better. I'd throw in that it, it's a step by step. Uh, just like anything, but for you artists out there, especially you creative individuals, put it in your work, you know, uh, make a statement, you know, chime in whichever way you can. In addition to, you know, your own personal efforts, uh, you can spread the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I would say um, the, I, I, I would have, Break the rule of saying only one thing and say two things. Okay. The first is I think everybody needs to realize that this is um, an all hands on deck proposition. So everyone needs to engage, uh, not just scientists, but we need musicians, we need artists, we need social scientists. Um, sorry. Um, the, uh, the other thing I, I think that's effective is to think of this a little bit like, the, like a diet but a carbon budget diet. So I think the first step is to figure out what, you know, what's your carbon budget? And then every year, think about how you can take that carbon budget down a notch. And that's, you know, it, uh, we do this in a lot of different sectors of our lives. The carbon budget should become a thing for us. Um, and you should think when you go into a grocery store, am I going to buy a piece of import, imported fruit that was flown clear across the world or am I going to grow, grow uh, you know, buy a piece of fruit that was grown in my backyard that may not look quite as perfect, mm -hmm. but is still just as nutritious? And by the way, has a much lower carbon footprint. Yeah. So, yeah, I think those are the two things I'd suggest. That's great. Just, That's great. I'm just going to add one quick thing about um, artistry that, like what Royal was saying, is that I am a voting member of the Grammy uh, Academy, the Recording Academy. Um, which, as we all know, is a very money-driven scenario. But I actually submitted What If We this past year to the music videos, um, which are, as if you've ever seen music videos that are happening out now, has nothing to do with What If We. And, I, and a lot of my fellow um, members who were voting wrote back to me and said, thank you for doing this. There needs to be more of this. It probably won't win an award, uh, but but it's really essential. So even, even that, there's, there, there was a lot of amazing feedback from, from people in the music world who said, thank you for doing this. Yeah, it's wonderful. There's, there was actually a piece in the New York Times recently, um, just last, uh, came out on, on March 25th about the climate crisis and what artists and musicians should do about it and actually walking the walk. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, you know, as an ecologist going, you know, we fly to meetings and present our work and a lot of people are really thinking about, do we want to be doing that? And of course, Zoom allows us to do a little bit less of that. Um, I think we're going to open up the conversation to, for audience questions in a moment. Um, so I encourage everyone on this webinar to submit questions for the uh, guests. I also just want to highlight in the link, there is um, a link to the Climate Music Project and the, that and some other um original pieces they have that focus on different aspects of climate change, like fossil fuel use, uh, land use change, increases in, in temperature and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So those are, um, you can find those works on the um, website of the Climate Music Project. 
Um, and I think we're gonna share a brand new short piece by the San Francisco based community organizer, hip hop artist and community activist, Kafri J. Um, that's a three minute call to action. Um, would any of you like to share a few words about it while they prepare the video? Sure. Uh, next up is a short call to action commissioned by the Climate Music Project. It's called Everything Matters, composed and performed by the award-winning hip hop artist, Kafri J with Martin Luther McCoy. So sit back and hear its simple message that in this climate crisis, the hero has to be each and every one of us. Here it is. Everything matters, every move we make, each and every single step that we choose to take, and everything grows, every single action builds, till it's heaven on earth, there's some killing fields, and every child's hoping every corporation sees, that your stock price ain't worth the air we breathe, worth the food we eat, or worth the lives we've lost, worth the animals, the plants, and the time it costs, which is the decade left to stop the worst effects, yo, we barely got a second for the earth is wrecked, heat's rising, the thirst is next, living places so toxic it'll hurt your chest, some corporations are care, so just work for Checks, but we playing that game of life, baby, you're up next. The worst is yet to come, so don't rely on them. You know it's time for us to rise up then. It's real talk, yo. The earth needs a hero. Where can we turn? In action is killing us. We just watching it burn. Take a simple action. It's the least you can do. You got to understand that the hero is you. It's your turn. Go learn. Speak out. We count. Go home. There's hope. It's time to be loud. Right now. Somehow. Spread love with us. Get out. This up. It's now. Don't sit out. It's your uh, turn. Everyone matters. Everybody's got some work to do now. You just search and choose yeah. how to pick a plan of action first. Move out. The science is clear. Just insert the tools yeah. now. So every seconds as precious as the essence of your child's future. Dude, you're not helpless, yo. And if you're privileged, you gotta get the message. It ain't up to the poor on earth to stop the wreckage, yo. Let's keep it real. They burning down the forest. Poison in the ocean. Lambs to the slaughter. Tribes being murdered. Just fighting for clean water. It ain't no time to waste if you're trying to see tomorrow. If you ain't Fight now that I might need to borrow your two hands and maybe your two ears to teach you a few things. The planet is too dear, so tell them what you think. The deadline's too near. Yeah. The earth needs a hero. Where can we turn? And action is killing us. We just watching it burn. Take a simple action. That's the least you can do. You got to understand that the hero is you. It's your turn. You can learn about the issue. Talk about it too with the people in your neighborhood, your family, your crew. You can gather the community and planning meetings too. When you make a plan of action, now you got something to do. Connect with people affected by climate change too. Reduce your carbon footprint and transit. Oh, you can join the NGO and get paid for it too. Just in the native people when you plan on what to do. Yeah. I need to hear on no cap. No cap. In action, killing us, killin us flat. One step and then you take two. Or maybe three. Realize the hero is you. No way to see. Our time no means it's our turn. It's true. Can't sit and just watch it burn. No, we gotta move. One step and then you take two. Let's go. Realize the hero is you. you know. Indigenous people have always been on the front lines of climate change. Oceans are being heavily impacted by everything from pollution, warming waters, and ocean acidification is impacting it indigenous coastal communities first and foremost. In the north, buildings are collapsing, causing indigenous communities to relocate as permafrost thaws, hurting traditions going back generations. And right now, public policy is key. We need to know our politicians and candidates' positions on climate change. We have to tell our representatives what it is we think they need to do. And if you haven't been doing anything, then get engaged and learn how you can make a difference. If you're already taking action, take it to the next level. If you think you're already doing all you can, then teach the next generation. Because every step we take matters from this moment on. So step with love for this Eden we've been given. The fight starts now, right now, right now.
that was that was really fantastic. And actually, I think it's really nice how it. Um, I, I mentioned there's all this work that doesn't tell you what to do, and I think ending even with that um, piece that really gives you a lot of pieces for action. Um, we're waiting for some questions from the audience. Um, so anyone, again, please submit any questions you have. Um, there's one in particular. So how did this collaboration uh, with uh, Kefri J come to be? Is that a question directed toward myself? No, I, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I have to have a climate music person answer that because that was... Yeah. Um, I Laurie, can, yeah, sure. Laurie, if you could answer. Sure, I can address that. Um, yes, we had a, um, oops, sorry. <clears throat> we had a, um, a, a big event planned and we were really searching for a way to increase our call to action. And so we did a few things for that event. We created an action brochure that I think you'll see a link to later, a QR code to. And then we commissioned a piece um, by Kefri J. We, we had, uh, he was doing a lot of work in this area and he, his work is motivating, his music is compelling. And we sat down with him and kind of went over parameters of that we really wanted to engage the audience and really home in on the point that we all need to take action, that everybody has a platform. Uh, we feel like we already are showing, demonstrating that by showing that kind of musicians have a platform. A lot of musicians didn't, don't even realize that they have these ready-made audiences that they can speak to. And so this was all part of kind of that dynamic and um, a real call to get people involved and motivated. Thank you. Um, another question. So there's a lot, you know, sea level rise is a topic that really hits home in uh, the greater Boston area where a lot of the um, Boston was actually built on landfill that was once you know, marshes and tidal flats. So would you consider making regional versions of pieces like this or would you encourage others to kind of adopt your approach and, and take a similar approach to reaching more local audiences? I think that's a great idea. I think that, the, that you could have visual footage from from regional areas and local areas um, so that it hits people specifically. I think that's a, that's a really good idea. And can I point out one of the goals of the Climate Music Project is to allow musicians in any area. Um, it, it's kind of a, a process and our, our long-term goal is actually to create music in multiple genre that address local issues, local climate issues, national, global, whatever, but we would like to get kind of the, the minions involved in this process. And, and I think, you know, related to something that you touched on earlier, Dr. Collins, there are a lot of inequities related to effects of climate change, mm -hmm. um, where the most vulnerable communities are often the most disadvantaged. Um, what are... I mean, do you have thoughts on ways in which, you know, the type of work here can help bring the importance and gravity of these social inequities to the forefront um, or, or, you know, what can really be done there um, when they're the people that often don't have the tools to make the change? Well, I, I, uh, first and foremost, I think it's important to empower them as well to express what they're going through musically so that they become part of the conversation uh, and, and we can hear from them what their life experiences are like. Um, at the same time, the one thing that's, that's new now that I'm very heartened to see is that the scientific community is looking directly at development goals that are sustainable. So that's, we're not just talking about science anymore, we're trying to figure out if we do the right thing, how is that, how does that make people's lives better? And so that's becoming very baked into the way that we look at the science. It's, it's all around uh, what we call sustainable development goals, but that's becoming front and center of how we uh, assess strategies for dealing with climate change. Can we 
not just survive, can we make people's lives worldwide better? Um, so it's sort of elevating our, our sites and a higher goal. Thank you. Um, so I think it's about time to wrap up. Um, I just want to uh, say thank you again so much to the Tisch College for hosting this event, um, the Environmental Studies Program, Fletcher School, Music Department and Office of Sustainability for co-sponsoring it. A huge thank you to our guests, Dr. Bill Collins, Wendy Loomis, uh, Royal Kent for your time sharing this great work. Also, Lori Goldman for being here and, and um, stepping in, especially to answer some of the questions, um, as well as Stephen Crawford and, and Fran Schulberg over at the Climate Music Project. Um, thank you, audience, for being here for your, and for your great questions. And uh, there's a QR code here that I think someone will explain um, in a moment. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The QR code disappeared, just so you know. <laughs> um, is there a way to share the QR code after the event? Um, the QR code, it, it, it's, um, will allow people to access our action brochure and information about what they can, what people can do, how people can get more involved in climate change issues. Um, so I, if there's a way to share it with the attendees afterwards, that would be great. And can you also link to that from the Climate Music Project? Um, I... I, we, we do have the information on our website. I'm not sure um, if there's a link, if the QR code is directly linked, but the information will be on our website for sure. Great, thank you. Lee, thanks and, so much. And thanks to everyone who made this uh, event possible. Very much appreciate all the effort that you put in into preparing the questions and and uh, organizing the Zoom and everything. This was a, quite a process to get us here today. And, and thank you for the opportunity to reach some of your community. Um, so very much appreciate that uh, chance to get the word about Comic Music Project out a little further. And, and thanks to Tisch College for bringing this all together. Um, I know it's um, it didn't exist when I was at Tufts, but I appreciate that this is, the College of Civic Engagement is a great place to kind of house all of the elements that need to come together to drive climate change, like Doc, um, like Bill Collins was saying earlier, that, you know, we really, it's not just the scientists, but it's a whole panoply of uh, groups and actors. So thank you to Tisch College and um, also other, all of the other participants from Tufts University. <laughs>